It's a great pleasure for me to be able to be here to take part in this special session. I'd like to thank Dr. Donna Hope Marquis and the rest of her team for enabling me to be here. The rich tapestry that is reggae music has a lot of different elements that come into it to make it as it is. You have uh, lyrics, you have vocalists, you've got the musicians, but sometimes an element that can be neglected when we think about the greatness of reggae music and its richness is that contributed to by the producers. And I think we can consider the producers of reggae music here in Jamaica as something akin to a film director, the directors of those classic cinema that have made such an impact all over the world. These are the gentlemen behind the scenes who um, harness the creativity of the players in the same way that a director harnesses that creativity of the actors and draws the best out of them they are really the crucial element that helps shape the music more than any other. In addition to that, they have to be concerned with the finance, with uh, getting everything in place so that the recordings can be made and that the music can then go out into the world. We are very privileged to have with us presently on this panel uh, three gentlemen who have uh, within themselves and their careers been responsible for changing the shape of reggae music several times over. So I'd like you to please put your hands together, give us a warm welcome for, uh, in the order in which they are seated, King Jammies, Bunny Striker Lee, and Bobby Digital. So as we consider the role of the producer uh, the role that you all have played and your colleagues in shaping this incredible music that has gone out and made such an impact around the world. I'd like to begin this session just by uh, having some opening remarks from the veteran in the business, Bunny Striker Lee, and I'd like you to illuminate for those in the audience who may not already be aware, how and when did you become to be involved in music? And I'd like to stress, you can give us a brief summary with brief being the operative word. Good evening. Good evening to everyone, one and all. It's, been a, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about reggae music. Um, around the business for a long time, over 50 years, but I started doing my thing in 1967 at Duke Reed Studio and, you know, come right on, right until now, I'm in the busy part. For myself, over 40 years, we bring in the, the name Reggae. We are in, from Rapsteady. Rapsteady really started in British Town. Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about, because as you say, you began producing yourself during the Rapsteady era. Yeah. But before we get to that, maybe you can tell the people a little bit about what were you doing before you were a record producer and how did you come to actually make your first production? Well, I was a record plugger. I used to go to teenage dance party, take record from Joe Breed, Beverly's, Coxon, and Leslie Kong, and get it played on the radio. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yes. And how did you then make the change so uh, that when, how and when did it happen that you actually took, made your first break into production? Well, Joe Creed gave me the, the first studio time free and lint it at 20 pounds and lint it with four musicians. He himself gave it a, um, Brian Atkins and Joe Isaacs and Gladson Anderson. Some of the classic musicians yeah. of the Rocksteady era. Yeah, but I, I did still go back and do some scam music to them. Oh, you did? Yeah, man. And who go did you do? Oh, you mean after you... Uh, yes, after yeah. I started with the Rocksteady. Go back with Val Bennett and them guys and do some scam music. Okay, but so what were the actual first recordings that you made? 
um, a tune named Do It To Me Baby with Derek Morgan doing the introduction with Light and the Groovers. Is it good to hear the sound of music? The beat is good, so do the rock steady. And the second one was um, Music Feel with Roy Shirley. Okay, well, let's take a little listen to a few bars now. Hold on. Let's take a little listen to a few bars. Yeah. Just to remind us ourselves of uh, how that sounds. Technical assistance, please. Okay, so Bunny, yeah. maybe you can tell the people a little bit about, in your mind, and also uh, Jamie and Bobby Digital, feel free to join in. What would you say characterized Rocksteady? What, how, how did Rocksteady differentiate itself from Ska? But as you said, Ska never leave the Jamaican music yet. Even when it slow down to rock city, you have, the git you have a Ska guitar playing and um, the uh, piano playing Ska still. So Ska is the backbone of the ja old Jamaican music. So Ska never leave the music. We start, we start, when you them start, them start doing the rhythm and blues thing. And you have a guy named Blue Jay who was trying to get the guitar to play something. And he said, make the guitar go scare, scare. And the scare name was born. Blue Jay. Mm -hmm. The, the bass player. Him. Yes. Chloe Johnson is his name. So the name Scare was born. You know? And then the rock steady. The way that beat in between the rock said it to him. It started around the shoulder, shoulder 17. Um, oh, yeah, they need to creep up on that book number. Better must come on them tune. Stick by me. Okay, well. Janko Skank. Since you just mentioned better must come, let's give a little listen to that to remind ourselves of that little rhythm that you just Yeah. <laughs> That's a cream bar yeah. 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 yeah.
Yep. Okay. And also, King Jenny, I'm sure most of the people here are familiar with the work that you did in the digital field, but some of them might not be aware that actually you're involved with the music that stretches right back to the same rock steady era or possibly earlier. Can you tell the people a little bit about your early involvement in music and what you observed in that dynamic shift from the sky to the rock steady? Good evening, David. Okay, um, I started my career in the mid 1974. That was when the Lama was in the Lama. I produced a song, a single version of Singer Girl by Nana Lee. That record didn't do well, you know, so I, you know, that was the first one. So I came back to Jamaica in 1976, and because I had a love for that song, I decided to record it again with different musicians. So, you know, I got Steve and Jimmy together and did it over. That time I didn't do that. But before I did that song, I used to speak of one of That's where I got my chicks from, you know, in the beginning. Bunny was a teacher. He taught me most of the things I learned in fellowship. But what about my business business? So it leads from that 
to my friend and I said, you know, back in the early 80s, say, uh, yeah, we have to start something we have eat with. Because our thing have to burn, you know, scorching and so you know we come up with that name from an American group by the name of the Heat Waves. And it was like we grew over the years to be like a little community sound system, you know. And it take not long before the name was all over the community. Everybody start to attend our parties and getting crazy, you know. So it was a good experience, you know. bad man in Jamaica, them call him Busby, call him Busby from Trenchtown. He used to come in the dance and dancing with all six girls, you know, and, <laughs> and they used to say Buzz and the girls are rock steady and then the name was born, rock steady, you know, same like how the scanning was born with QJ. So, uh, Huh? Um, well, Lee Perry and myself and um, when when was experiment with the, the Janko Skank. No, we start doing nothing in '68. We start doing a reggae now with that thing named Bangaram, Glen Adams. We had. A, of this session and um no keyboard man never turn up and Joe Breed said to me said Bonnie Glenn can help himself you know I said Glenn no you never tell me call Glenn Capo I said thank you Mr Reed the session on and we go upstairs and the rest is history Glenn Glenn played the first reggae tune it's the organ going reggae reggae it's the organ shuffle in the music you know it's the reggae it, you take the album shop out of the music, it go right back to rock steady. You hear that organ shuffling? That that is what that is what they call reggae. Well, make make I tell you something about this tune. This tune here. When was we now? You know, a guy from England, a jazz musician named Kenny Bryan. You must hear about him. He did a tune named Bongo Chant. Is it was going to do? But um, Glenn them as new musician couldn't hold the cards for the bridge. You know, and Lester said, Bonnie, oh, make me do something different. I said, turn it in a two card tune. And we can use Beckham in it again. And Lester said, oh, Bangaran song. I said, yeah, Lester, and called Stranger and Charmer to sing the moment I want Bangaran. So and the rest of that tune is history. Basically, 
yes, my Kenny Graham Bangarang, Bangarang coming from Bongo Chan. If you listen to Bongo Chan, it's the same. The only difference is the bridge. Because my guys, them was too young, them could hold the cards to play. Now, in general, David, yeah, yes. We had a music before him. They call it Calypso or Mento and Quadrille in Jamaica. You know. That is real Jamaican root music, you know, because most of our songs even build up with some of those melodies up till now. You know. mm -hmm. yes. 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 The influence of Mento. You look at the Johnny Boys then. So as we trace the further developments, once we're now in the reggae era, so we just heard that reggae came in as this fast-paced music with this organ shuffle. But after about a year, the music changed again. What happened and why? No, it, 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 um, it's still going in a different fashion because when King come in with Slim King, when the electronic music comes in, King becomes Superman. You understand? It was un untouchable. This become overnight, you know, like when you <laughs> when you write, come and say, we can turn and tell the people I give you some cup. Eh? The, the sneak thing, you change the whole thing. And everybody got to computer music. Okay, well, we'll be looking at a little more closely at Slang Tang in just a few moments, but before that, there's a couple of other developments along the way that I'd like to bring up. And there's one that happened in the mid-1970s that was very influential in Jamaica for about a year and a half, or maybe two years. And I'm referring to this sound based on an open and closed hi-hat, what they call the flying symbol, or some know it as flyers. 
So, what can you enlighten the audience here about the development of that style? That did you know, that he did know that she can't really know what he did, and I used to like, he can't go to the right to me. And like, we, and I know what to do, which I particularly like what I do. I like the flyers. So, when, when they play that beat notes, I just call the flyers and they take on. So, I'm playing the guitars to play, to match it, you know, check it, check it, but I'm playing them together. So what was, what was the first song to make use of Flyers and who were the musicians that played it? Well, it was a um, family man that was in the um, Bob Moore band at the time, was playing scat guitar, Shina was playing lead guitar, Robbie was playing um, bass, Carlton Davis to Carlton Santa was playing drums. And, and the song was? Huh? And which song was it that unleashed? What no, song? No, okay, well, let's take a little listen to a few notes of that song. sound everybody every producer wanted that sound on their record for yeah. a period of time because the, the sound system was changing and everybody was playing the take on right so the sound system was a crucial force in that so as well sound system, even now sound system is crucial because Jan was going to come like that it was like for a radio station in the world of the American song, American film, very big part in this. Okay, so obviously there are all kinds of other innovations that we could cover, but since we don't have all day, we're not going to go through them all. Yeah. But you were mentioning a little while ago Slang Tang, which obviously revolutionized everything. But before we get to Slang Tang, King Jammy, when you began to do your productions, 
when you were still known largely as Prince Jammy, you were doing roots music. Tell us a little bit about the roots reggae that you recorded, who you were working with, and what made your sound stand out. Well, um, of course, I used to listen to so many different producers of Westside, different productions. I started to have an idea in my head that I want to come with something different, you know? So, when I started my production, Langwood, you know, they had an Arabian song, which one of the endorsed that song. He was the one that came in to tell you to carry on that, that, that song, you know what I mean? So, when the Langwood came, we went to London, we went to England with the production and Count Shelley, the third record, you know, heard them and he said, Boy, this, this production is wicked. It's a new thing, you know. I love it. So he released that album. It didn't really do big in England at that period, but everybody loved the music. But because it was such a new thing, it didn't catch on that time. So later on, now, you know, you know, another company put the album and re released it, and it did it much better. So, it sounds like it was somewhat ahead of its time, and you had a whole little community of vocalists that you were working with there in Waterhouse, where you have been always been based. Yes. Who was some of the, yeah. Well, in Waterhouse, as part of this life, there were a lot of sound systems, a lot of parties, on the weekend, you know, you didn't even know which one to do. So, the same way I had with artists, that have young talent, you know. So, when I started, I started out with new talents, because I said to myself, I listen to Zero, I listen to Zanata, you know. I want to come up with some new artists to like form a new crew. So, you know, we had like travelers, Perman, Will Smith, Junior Ray, those were the artists that I started working with. Half Fire. Yeah, Half Fire. Okay, and another one that comes to mind was a singer called Laxley Castell. Yeah, maybe somewhat obscure, but a fantastic vocalist. And I'd like to play a few numbers of his best known track, just to remind what Prince Jamie's production sounded like in the Roots Reggae era. <laughs> singer who ended up in Black Uhuru later, but here he was as a young man starting out, and I'm speaking of course of Junior Reed. Thank you. 
basically saying, Jeremy, that part of what made your sound the way it was and made it different was all that experience that you'd had as an engineer before you had gone into production yourself. Both as an engineer and as a sound operator, I had a first and useful VMO experience producer that I wanted to That's what gave me my experience. Okay, well, before we move on to the slang tank era and digital dance hall, I'd like to play a few brief video clips. And so to start off with, we've got a couple of quotes from Bunny Striker Lee. This is from a film that was shot in 1982, Deep Roots Music by Howard Johnson. Yeah. Apologies once again for uh, technical difficulties. So we'll see while, they, while they're trying to sort that out. Yes, we'll try that out. Yeah. Let's just go back to uh, our discussion then. Um, Jamie, again, tell us a little bit about one of the things that you became concretely involved with during the same era before the music shifted to digital is dub as an art form, and you were one of the chief architects of dub. So tell us a little bit about how did dub come into being, how did it evolve, and what was your role within that process? Well, that's again going to strike me, because there is so many stars about it. You know, when you're going to the poor person, when you're going to the cis person, the person is straight away. You know, without the poor person, the topic of the poor person, the topic of the poor person, the topic of the poor person, because you compile the data they have done. That was very famous, popular in Europe, the Dalai was popular in Europe. So that was why we used to you know, mix the style, the Dalai was style, the Dalai reverb and delay. That is really hard to go mix. John Paul Collins, John Lewis, sometimes in the rhythm section, echo it away. And if it had arms, it would delay the arms and hold your leg for a long time and you know, keep on going. It's an influential music. And Bonnie Stryker Lee and Bobby Digital, what are some of your thoughts about when Dub first emerged and the impact that it made and any role you may have had to play in it? Yeah, say that again. No? Yeah, when Dub first came on the scene, what do you remember about it? Thank you. 
you first began working with Jemmy? Technical, no? Apologies for the technical difficulties, apologies for the harm. We'll be back to Bobby Digital's story and what happened to Psyche and so on, but first we've got these long overdue video clips to play. So the first two clips, just listen to what Bonnie Stryker was saying in 1982 about the changes in the music and the continuity in the music. Thank <laughs> you. 
So, yes. oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so tell us a little bit about Wayne Smith. There he is in that video. There's a little bit of Wayne Smith. And the sound looks very different from what we associate with him with Snipe Tell us a little bit about working with him. And then tell us a little bit about Snipe Tech. And Bobby, feel free to join in. Yes, this part here.
these tracks come up into the early 90s. Everything is just computer rhythm digitized. But then another change starts to happen, or a return, or some kind of renewal. And I'm thinking specifically, again, Bobby, your production is coming into the 90s, going into the middle 90s, start to get more depth and three-dimensional, where you have some kind of blend of digital instruments and live instruments. And it seemed to be something that other producers also began to explore and adopt. What can you tell us about that? Thank you. 